This morning, the politics of 725. Minimum wage in America is long overdue for a makeover. Plus, the complicated case of CeCe McDonald and what happens when a woman serves time in a men's prison. And if I were to ask you, where's the kitchen? Would you know that I was talking about a black woman's hair? But first, the debate over stop and frisk. Effective police tool or a civil rights violation? Good morning, I'm Melissa Harris-Perry. Before we begin, I wanna bring you up to date on a couple of stories that we brought to you yesterday. In Syria, at least 35 people were killed in the last 24 hours by the Syrian army in the province of Homs. Nine people alone today were killed, according to opposition activists. Meantime, Syria's main opposition group, the Syrian National Council, has elected a Kurdish dissident as its new leader at a meeting in Turkey. And Spain has agreed to take a bailout of $125 billion from its European neighbors. The deterioration of Spain's banks was threatening to bankrupt its government. Now, let's move to our top story of the morning. There is a blatant disregard for our civil liberties, and it's happening right here in New York City. For young men of color in cities around the country, it seems that something not so funny happens on their way to school and work and walking down the street minding their own business on a daily basis. And what happens to them is conducted by the very people who are sworn to protect and serve the community. I'm referring to the police practice of stop and frisk. In 2011, New York City police officers stopped 685,724 people. That's a 600% increase since 2002. Now that was the first year of Michael Bloomberg's tenure as mayor of New York City. During his 10 years in office, the number of stops is just under 4.4 million. And what was the top reason for NYPD stops in 2011? That would be furtive movements, which accounted for more than 50% of the stops. You know, furtive, fly, shifty, kind of how Trayvon Martin was allegedly acting on the night that he was shot and killed. Make no mistake, there is definite racial component to this. Of those stopped by the NYPD in 2011, 52.9% were black. 33.7% were Latino, and 9.3% were white. Now the numbers flip when looking at the city's overall population. In the, in the city, only 25.5% of black and 28.6% are Latinos, and 44% are white. And just how successful was the NYPD last year? Now out of the nearly 700,000 stops, more than 600,000 people were innocent, according to a recent report by the New York Civil Liberties Union. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's, that's something I just don't have to worry about. I mean, let me just suggest this. You may not be young or black or a man or living in the city, but you should care. Stop and frisk policies ask us to make a trade-off between our civil liberties and our public safety. And before we do, shouldn't we know if the practice actually makes us safer? Because last year, out of all of those stops the NYPD made, a whopping 6%, 6% resulted in arrests. So when the question becomes, why would certain kinds of people be under surveillance while others are not? Now, this is not to say that surveillance would have prevented Columbine killers Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris from killing 13 and injuring 20 in 1999. And we'll never know what it might have done to stop Oklahoma City uh, bomber Timothy McVeigh from taking 186 lives in 1995. But, but it does make one wonder, what if everyone was watched and stopped and frisked equally? Would it make us feel safer or would it make us feel that our rights had been violated? Stop and frisk isn't new. The 1968 Supreme Court case, Terry versus Ohio, established a legal basis for officers to stop, question, and frisk citizens. And even before stop and frisk became a popular catchphrase, there was another one, racial profiling. Regardless of the term, it all means the same things to those who experience it. If your skin is brown, if you're perceived to be a threat, or you don't belong in a certain area, then it's likely that you'll be stopped. Despite promises by both Democratic and Republican leaders to do away with racial profiling, we see it manifested in other forms. Governor Jan Brewer has taken her fight over Arizona State Bill 1070 all the way to the Supreme Court. There are four main provisions being challenged, but the one most closely associated with stop and frisk is that police can demand papers and investigate a person's immigration status if they suspect a person is undocumented. Now, I would really love for someone to explain to me how you can tell if someone is undocumented because no one looks undocumented unless you have preconceived notions of what racial or ethnic or linguistic characteristics go along with undocumented status. But I come back 
to why this should matter, not just to certain communities, but to everyone. We've spoken before in Nerdland about citizens having the right to lead and live complete and full lives. It's, it's a founding principle of our country and one that should not be taken for granted. So when a person's basic rights and humanity are challenged simply because of how they look or the color of their skin or how their genes fit, that doesn't just affect them, it affects our very democracy. Joining me is Elsa Chang, criminal justice reporter for WNYC Radio, and Thea Butler, professor of religious studies at the University of Pennsylvania, Alan Jenkins, executive director of the Opportunity Agenda, and from South Carolina, former NYPD detective and director of the Black Law Enforcement Alliance, Mark Claxton. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for having us. So Thank also you for having me. Elsa, your reporting on this has been amazing. I've tried to kind of lay out the scope of the problem here, but tell me what else I've missed. What is the scope of the stop and frisk problem? Well, essentially what we see here is that the city's crime rate continues to decrease, but stop and frisks are increasing. Mm. It's catapulting, actually, as you stated. Since Mayor Bloomberg took office in 2002, there are about 100,000 stop and frisks in the city. Now, we've seen homicide decline since 2002, about 11%. Meanwhile, stop and frisks have increased more than 600%. Now, if you look at the number of shootings that took place when Mayor Bloomberg first took, first took office, it was about 1,800 shootings that year. We'll look at us today, shootings are still ranging in about the 1,800 hmm. range. So despite almost 700,000 people being stopped in frisk, we're not seeing huge drops between 2002 and 2011. So for you, this is evidence that stop and frisk, although it's a, a, an enormous uh, practice, is not one that is necessarily an effective practice? Well, the police say, and the mayor says, that look, it's because of stop and for us that violent crime rates have gone down in the city but we're looking at violent crime rates going all the way back to the early 90s. I mean, homicide has dropped more than 80% in New York City since the early 90s, but the vast majority of that decline took place before Bloomberg even took office in 2002. What we've seen since Bloomberg took office is this 11% decrease in homicide, meanwhile, a six-fold increase in stop and frisks. Yeah, I guess I was surprised when I looked at the, the chart, um, sort of the decade of Bloomberg in office, and we look at sort of that straight line up of the number of stop and frisks, sort of how many people are being stopped and part of what surprised me about it is our sense that um, you know just sort of not living in New York City all the time Giuliani when Mayor Giuliani was mayor you heard all the time that this mayor was sort of bad relative in terms of policing to black and brown communities but I don't have this sense sort of in the milieu that people understand or think of Bloomberg as necessarily hostile but again that graph shows you know a very clear representation of an increase of this behavior but if you go into communities in your city like Brownsville Brooklyn or East New York or the South Bronx or East Harlem heavily black and Latino neighborhoods they feel like they live live in a different world. It is almost like a tale of two cities for these hmm. people because young men, I spoke to several young men throughout the city. I mean, if you are in the age range between 14 and 24, there is a huge likelihood that you will get stopped. In fact, about 40%, more than 40% of the stop and frisk last year were of black and Latino men between yep. 14 and 24. They only represent 5% of the entire city population. population right. In fact, there's a stagger, staggering statistic that gets cited often. The number of stops of young black black men between 14 and 24 last year exceeded the entire population of <laughs> right, young black right. men. So yeah, apparently they stopped all of them and then their friends who were visiting from Jersey too. Yeah. Uh, officer, I want to bring you in on this a bit because, you know, I, I think it's very easy as we look at these sorts of numbers to immediately go to a, a position of either vilifying the mayor or the police chief or the, the kind of frontline officers. From your assessment as a retired New York City police officer, is it your assessment that stop and frisk is actually a good policy, one that is protective of these communities? <laughs> Well, th there are several problems with the policy itself and the practices as, as done by the NYPD, and I think it's been pointed out uh, very brilliantly that the numbers don't lie in as far as the, the level of stops, particularly in the black and Latino communities. That's important uh, to point out that we have a definite racial component in regards to these stops. Yes, the stops are exponentially increased since the days of Giuliani. Yes, there is excessive stopping and frisking searching of young blacks and Latinos uh, throughout the city. And the, But the crux of it is, why is it happening to blacks and Latinos in their neighborhoods? Why are innocent mm -hmm. black and Latino families, yeah. mothers, fathers, our elders and seniors being stopped at the same rate as our young folk now in many neighborhoods? Yeah. So the, the policy of stop and frisk 
as you indicated, is rooted in that Terry versus Ohio decision, that Supreme Court decision, yeah. and based in large part on the, on the Fourth, uh, Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. But it's how police departments choose to right. apply the stop and frisk is the real problem. And in New York City, stop and frisk is applied definitely without a doubt, and the stats bear it out uh, racially. This yep. is a racial profiling issue, and that's why the momentum is built surrounding it. So, so Alan, if, I, if, I'm a, if I'm an MHP viewer and I am living in suburban Ohio, and, and we're talking about stop and frisk in New York City neighborhoods, why should I care? What difference does this make to me? Well, you know, it's a great question. We need to step back. We all deserve a law enforcement system that keeps us safe, that's based on evidence, and that upholds the American values of equal justice under law, due process. Racial profiling fails on all of those scores, mm -hmm. and that the massive nature of these stop and frisks does so as well. So it's something we all need to worry about. It's counter to public safety. It's counter to our values. It undermines faith in law enforcement. That hurts everybody. Yeah, I want to just real quickly before we go, I want to just let you weigh in on the notion of this cost benefit analysis, Anthea, because it, it feels like what we're told is public safety for civil liberties. Is there some reasonable way that we can try to assess public safety versus civil liberties? Yeah, I think there is. But I also think that the, the, the one big thing about this that really is troubling to me is that it's public, they're stopping everybody in their own communities. Yeah. And so this is this is the issue. It's like they're policing the communities. Yes, there's public safety, but I don't think that they care about public safety safety in our communities okay let me let me be blunt that's first second is it's just as it's like an old plantation mentality about you have to have your pass to leave outside of the plantation and the neighborhood is the new plantation and they're policing that but they're not policing the other things that are going on in the neighborhood because they're too busy stopping and frisking people who don't who are not doing anything and when there's real crime other things don't happen as fast or the police don't come when you're called yeah. so I think this is it it's you know we want public safety on the one hand but on the other hand what we don't don't want is a police force that's going overboard and trying to do what they think is right, but which is egregious policy. Right, relative to people living in the community. Melissa. We are not even anywhere near done with this topic. We are staying on this. Elsa Cheng, thanks for coming and giving us the overview on this. Your reporting has been wonderful. But coming up, as Elsa just told us, the people who are experiencing this are young African-American men. Do you remember our young men, our table of teenagers from our Trayvon story? They are back, and we are going to talk with them, these same young men we introduced you to a few months ago, about their experiences with stop and frisk. So come back and stay right here.